is Jack, and I never believed in the supernatural. Not until that fateful night at a McDonald's in my small Alabama town. Fresh out of school, the job was supposed to be a simple way to earn some cash. But what transpired that night was anything but simple. The evening began typically enough, with the usual bustle of customers and the familiar routine of preparing fast food fries, burger patties, buns, ice creams, more fries, apologizing to an angry customer even though it wasn't your fault. A few online orders here, covering the coffee shifts there. And just when you sit down to scroll a few mindless TikToks, fries again. However, as the night progressed and the customer flow dwindled, an unusual patron caught my attention. A woman in a tattered raincoat. Her hair was dark, her eyes unnervingly focused on me. She ordered a coffee and sat in a dimly lit corner of the restaurant, her gaze never wandering from my direction. It actually took me some time to figure out that I was being checked out. Now, I don't mean to brag, but I have had my fair share of could cut glass with this jawline moments. It was half genetics and half malnutrition that did it. But hey, if poverty can make you look sexy, what's the harm, right? Anyway, I tried to shake off the eerie feeling she gave me, dismissing it as mere fatigue, or perhaps my imagination running wild. The hours ticked by, and the diner gradually emptied, leaving an oppressive silence in its wake. That's when my co-worker, the only other person in the restaurant, suddenly collapsed. The shock of it jolted me from the numbness of my routine. One moment, was washing the fryer and cribbing about his girlfriend, who has a thing for his credit cards. The next moment, his face was rushing to meet the ground. I rushed to his side, finding him unconscious but breathing. I grabbed him and somehow managed to get him to his car, advising him to get some sleep. His girlfriend's place was two blocks away, so even though I offered to drop him, sure that he was fine. I don't know, bro, he said. Yo, one moment I was fine, and then it felt like, I don't know, like I was tied to a tree and people were burning fire all around me. The temperature rose and dropped. Bro, I tell you, that refrigerator is going to be the death of me. That thing is broken, yo. The parking lot was quiet almost unnaturally so, and I felt a chill in the air as I watched him drive away. Returning to the diner, I found the woman had left, but her raincoat remained, hanging over the back of the chair like a spectral reminder of her presence. Approaching her table, I noticed something peculiar a tissue, crumpled and discarded on it. In jagged, almost frantic handwriting, was a message that sent a shiver down my spine. Convince them, or they will think it is you. The words were ominous, cryptic, and unsettling. I pondered their meaning, a growing sense of unease taking hold of me. And as the night deepened, strange and disturbing sounds began to fill the diner. It started with soft, desperate pleas for help voices that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere all at once. Then came the screams, agonizing cries that echoed through the empty restaurant, filled with pain and terror. To my growing horror, the distant crackling sound of a fire joined the cacophony, intensifying in volume and urgency. The situation was soon spiraling into madness. I decided to leave, to escape the nightmare that was unfolding around me. But my escape was thwarted when I found the door inexplicably locked, sealed shut from the inside. I had the keys, and I dropped. After helping my colleague Bill to his car, 
I faced the perplexing situation of the inexplicably locked front door. There was no way someone could have closed it from the outside, and my attempts to open it were futile. Ignoring the haunting voices and screams, I rushed to the back door, certain that whatever was happening wouldn't bring any good news. My fears were confirmed when I found the back door was also sealed shut. The realization that I was trapped inside with the escalating sounds of terror was paralyzing. The diner, once a place of mundane work, had transformed into a scene from a horror story. The cryptic message, the locked doors, the haunting sounds, all these elements intertwined creating a tapestry of fear and confusion. I was caught in the midst of it, alone and bewildered, facing a night that was quickly turning into something out of a ghost story. Trapped inside the diner, with the cacophony of screams and the crackling fire growing around me, my sense of reality began to blur at the edges. The diner, once a haven of greasy comfort food, had transformed into a nightmarish landscape. I felt a primal fear take hold, the kind that grips you in the dead of night when every shadow seems alive. As I paced frantically, searching for any means of escape, the diner's lights flickered ominously, casting eerie shadows across the walls. It was then that I first saw them horrifying apparitions, figures with severe burn injuries, their expressions contorted in pain and anger. They seemed to notice me, reaching out with charred hands, only to vanish as soon as they touched me. Their presence was both terrifying and heart-wrenching. In a desperate attempt to understand what was happening, I ventured into the back of the restaurant, a section I rarely visited. There, hidden behind old storage racks, I discovered a decayed part of the building I never knew existed. In its place was a small, dusty room that seemed out of place, as if something from the past that didn't belong there. The walls of this small room were lined with old, yellowed newspaper clippings. My eyes were drawn to a headline that sent chills down my spine. Devastating fire at local business claims. Numerous lives. The date was decades ago. But then I read something which sent chills down my spine. The articles detailed a tragic fire that had occurred on these very premises. Back when it was a bustling furniture market. Worse yet, amidst the images of the deceased, I saw a few familiar faces. The faces in the photos matched the apparitions haunting me. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. The apparitions, the sounds, they were all echoes of this tragic past. But the horror didn't stop there. As I returned, the ghosts became more aggressive. Objects began to fly off shelves, as if hurled by unseen forces from the kitchen counter were thrown in my direction, narrowly missing me. Scorching handprints appeared on the walls, leaving behind a smell of burnt flesh. I dodged and weaved, avoiding the flying debris, my mind racing. The diner was a tomb, a sight of unspeakable tragedy had enveloped the diner, and I was its unwilling captive. The spirits of those lost in the fire were restless, their pain and anger palpable, reaching out to me. Amidst the chaos, I discovered more clippings that revealed another layer to the tragedy rumors of foul play. Suspicions that the fire was no accident. The owner at the time, Mr. Sanders, was suspected of setting the blaze for insurance money, though nothing was ever proven. The accusations cast a dark shadow over the tragedy. As the atmosphere in the diner shifted again, the temperature dropping suddenly, a 
as if the very air was being sucked away. I felt an unnerving sensation of being watched by something unseen. Each step I took was heavy, filled with dread. The walls of the diner seeming to close in on me. The faces of the victims in the newspaper clippings, staring accusingly. Then it happened, a vision so vivid. It was as though I was transported to another time. I found myself inside the burning furniture market, surrounded by flames. The heat was suffocating. The screams of the trapped victims piercing the air. I felt their agony, their desperation. It was a glimpse into the hellish final moments of those who perished in the fire. Emerging from the vision, gasping for air, I understood the depth of the suffering that had occurred here. The diner was not just a building. It was a grave for those lost souls, a place where their pains still lingered, their cries for justice unheard. As I stood there, reeling from the vision and the revelations, I heard a voice call out, you did this. That's when it hit me. These trapped souls mistakenly thought that I was responsible for their deaths. I knew I had to find a way to calm the spirits, to prove that I was not the one responsible for their anguish. The task seemed impossible, but it was the only chance I had to escape this nightmare. Still reeling from the terrifying vision of the burning furniture market, I struggled to comprehend the full extent of the tragedy that had unfolded decades ago on the very ground where the McDonald's now stood. The air in the restaurant felt heavy, charged with the anguish and despair of the lost souls. As I navigated through the chaos of the haunted diner, the temperature fluctuated wildly, plunging into an icy chill before surging to an oppressive heat that mimicked the flames of the past sensation of being followed by something unseen intensified. An invisible presence that seemed to hover just over my shoulder, its breath cold against my neck. In my panicked state, I remembered the owner, Mr. Sanders, and the accusations leveled against him, desperate for answers. I scoured the diner for any clues any remnants of the past that could help me understand. That's when I noticed something I had overlooked before. A distinct ring with the letter S on Mr. Sanders' finger. In an old framed photograph on the wall. The same to appear scrawled the condensation on the windows. Etched into the very air it seemed desperate cries from the past, etching themselves into the present. The ring I had found in the woman's abandoned raincoat, with the distinct S that matched the one in the old photograph, was undoubtedly linked to Mr. Sanders. The connection was undeniable. The restaurant, once a lively market and now rebuilt, held within its walls the echoes of a cursed past. The whispers of the tragedy were everywhere, in the very fabric of the building. The spirits, tormented and restless, seemed to be everywhere, their presence growing stronger, more oppressive with each passing moment. Suddenly, I was gripped by another vision, more intense and terrifying than the first. I was inside the burning market again, but this time I was one of the trapped victims. I could feel the searing heat of the flames, the smoke filling my lungs, the desperation and fear. The screams of the others around me were deafening. I could hear their pleas for help, feel their struggle as the fire consumed everything. Jolted back to reality, I was left gasping for air my heart racing. The vision had been so vivid, so real, that it took me a moment to orient myself. The spirits were trying to communicate their pain, 
their story through me. As I struggled to make sense of it all, the diner continued to descend into chaos. Objects were still flying off the shelves, the ghostly apparitions growing in intensity and number. The scorching handprints on the wall seemed to multiply, a terrifying reminder of the fire's deadly grip. It was clear that the spirits mistook me for someone else, perhaps someone involved in the tragedy. The weight of their mistaken accusations was a heavy burden, their need for justice and release palpable. I had to find a way to convince them of my innocence, to quell their anger and help them find peace. Remembering the cryptic message on the tissue left by the woman in the raincoat, I realized what I had to do. The message, convince them or they will think it is you a warning, a clue to resolving this nightmare. I needed to communicate with the spirits, to let them know I was not the one responsible for their suffering. As the spirits converged on me, their anger reaching a fever pitch, I remembered the woman's abandoned raincoat. Driven by instinct, I searched it and found the ring with the distinct S. It was a piece of the puzzle connection to the past, to the tragedy, and possibly to Mr. Sanders himself. With the ring in hand, I prepared to confront the spirits, to share my revelation, and hopefully bring them the peace they so desperately sought. The diner was a whirlwind of paranormal activity, with apparitions manifesting more aggressively than ever. Kitchen utensils flew through the air, as if wielded by invisible, furious hands, narrowly missing me as I ducked and wove through the chaos. The once familiar signs and menus came crashing down around me, creating a cacophony of noise and confusion. Amidst this turmoil, messages began, forgotten, the act of simply recognizing their story seemed to offer them a semblance of peace, a step towards the resolution they had been denied for so long. The realization that the spirits mistook me for someone connected to their tragedy was a harrowing burden. But in that moment, it became clear that they saw me not just as a potential key to their release or revenge, but as a conduit through which their stories could be heard desperate pleas for help and vows of revenge that had appeared on the windows and mirrors in what looked like soot were the tormented souls of the fire victims reaching out through every available surface seeking justice or release from their eternal suffering. I recalled the woman's ominous words on the tissue, convinced them or they will think it is you. It was a warning, a directive that I now understood all too well. As I clutched the ring with the distinct S, a symbol connecting me to the past, to Mr. Sanders, and to the woman in the raincoat, I prepared to make my stand. The spirits converged on me, their ethereal forms swirling anger and pain. I felt their eyes upon me, their gaze heavy with accusation. In a moment of desperate courage, I raised my voice. I'm not who you think I am, I shouted, my words seemingly lost in the chaos. But I pressed on, driven by a need to quell their anger and bring them peace. I explained that I had no connection to the fire the tragedy that had befallen them. I was just a worker at the diner, unwittingly caught in the midst of their anguish. Holding up the ring, I implored them to see the truth. The ring was a symbol, a piece of the past that I had inadvertently become entwined with. I spoke of the woman in the raincoat, her mysterious message, and how I came to find myself in possession of the ring 
apparitions paused, their forms flickering as if in doubt. The intensity of their anger seemed to wane, replaced by a cautious curiosity. It was a moment of respite, a chance for me to reach out to them further. I pleaded with them to understand, to recognize that I was not the architect of their suffering. I spoke of my own fears and confusion, of being thrust into a nightmare I could not comprehend. My words were a mix of apology and explanation, a desperate plea for understanding. As I spoke, the chaos around me began to subside. The flying objects settled, the crashing signs stilled, and the messages on the mirrors and windows faded. The spirits, their forms less menacing now, seemed to be listening, their need for vengeance giving way to a desire for the truth. In that moment, I realized the power of acknowledgement, of giving voice to the pain and suffering of those long forgotten. The act of simply recognizing their story seemed to offer them a semblance of peace a step towards the resolution they had been denied for so long. Spirits and free both her family's legacy and the tormented souls from the chains of their shared tragic past. She understood the depth of the anguish that the fire's victims, including my father, had endured and sought a way to mend the rift that tragedy had created. Even if it meant orchestrating a night of terror for an unsuspecting stranger. Thank you, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the gentle night breeze. I know the toll this night has taken on you, but you've brought peace to those lost souls, and in doing so, have lifted a curse that lingered over my family and this place. The realization my actions, driven by a thirst for vengeance, had inadvertently led to this moment of reconciliation, was overwhelming. The woman in the raincoat, Sanders' daughter, had recognized the potential for healing and took a risk that few would dare. Her plan, while fraught with peril, had ultimately led to the resolution of a decades-long torment for the spirits, and offered a semblance of peace to the living. As she turned to leave, she paused and looked back at me. Maybe now we can all find some peace, she said, before disappearing into the night. I watched her go, the weight of her words sinking in. The diner, once a sight of unspeakable tragedy, now stood silent testament to the power of acknowledgement and the possibility of redemption. I knew that the events of this night would stay with me forever. A haunting reminder of the past's grip on the present and the unforeseen consequences of our actions. But as I walked away from the diner, the ring still clutched in my hand, I felt a sense of release. The spirits, once bound by their tragic past, had found their voice through me, and in doing so, had granted me a measure of forgiveness for my own haunted past. The night's ordeal was over, but the journey towards understanding and reconciliation was just beginning. The diner, a place of both mundane routine and supernatural terror had become a crossroads of sorts, a place where the past and present collided, offering a chance for healing and hope. The encounter with the woman in the raincoat, now revealed as Sanders' daughter, had taken an unexpected turn, weaving together the threads of our shared tragedies. Her actions, though mysterious and alarming at first, stemmed from a deep-seated desire to bring peace to the restless spirits that haunted the diner, including my father's.
the complexity of our intertwined histories, marked by loss and the quest for justice, suddenly seemed less burdensome, replaced by a budding sense of understanding and forgiveness. Her proposal for a date, an offer so mundane yet so profound in its implications, symbolized a tentative step towards healing gesture of moving beyond the shadows cast by our family's pasts. It was an opportunity to forge a new path, one not defined by the misdeeds and misfortunes that had brought us together under such extraordinary circumstances. As we parted ways, the emerging dawn symbolized more than just the end of a long and tumultuous night. It heralded a new beginning chance to build upon the ruins of the past with the hope of a brighter future. The diner, the sight of so much pain and turmoil, now stood as a beacon of resilience, a place where the truth had finally surfaced, allowing those affected to find solace. Walking away from the diner, first rays of sunlight warming my face, I felt a profound sense of release. The spirits that had once roamed its confines, bound by their tragic end, had found the peace they so desperately sought, and in their liberation, a part of me was freed as well, a part that had been ensnared in the grief and rage of the past. The diner, once a mere backdrop to mundane routines and simple meals, had transformed into a sacred space of memory and healing. It was a reminder that even in the face of overwhelming tragedy, there is always a possibility for reconciliation and renewal. The spirits, my father among them, could now rest, their stories acknowledged presence no longer a haunting, but a part of the diner's rich tapestry. As I moved forward, the diner receding into the background, I carried with me the lessons of that night, the importance of confronting the past, the power of truth to heal, and the unexpected connections that can arise from shared experiences of loss. The road ahead was uncertain, but the weight of the past was no longer an anchor, but a bridge to a future where the pain of yesteryears could finally find its resting place. In the quiet aftermath of a night that had unraveled the tightly wound threads of the past, revealing the intricate tapestry of interwoven fates and hidden truths, the diner stood silent, a silent witness to the reconciliation of spirits, both living and departed. The dawn's early light cast a soft glow over the scene, symbolizing a new day and the promise of renewal. Jack, once a mere bystander to the diner's hidden history, emerged transformed, carrying with him weight of newfound knowledge and the lightness of resolved spirits. The encounter with the woman in the raincoat, a stranger bound by a shared legacy of loss and longing for justice, had culminated in an unexpected connection, a bridge across the chasm of their shared past, their tentative steps towards one another, marked by a proposed date hinted at the possibility of healing, not just for themselves, but for the wounds etched into the very walls of the diner. As Jack walked away, the diner receding into the backdrop of his life story, he carried with him a profound sense of closure. The spirits, once restless echoes of a tragic fire, had found peace silent pleas for recognition, finally heard and honored. The diner, 
a locus of supernatural turmoil, had returned to its mundane reality. Yet, it would forever hold the echoes of the night when the veil between worlds had thinned, allowing for a fleeting connection and reconciliation. The first light of dawn marked not just the end of a night, but the beginning of a new chapter for Jack, the woman in the raincoat, and the spirits that had haunted the diner. It was a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, the enduring quest for truth, and the redemptive power of confronting the shadows of the past. In the stillness of the dawn, there was a sense of completion, a closing of a circle that had begun in the flickering lights and shadowed corners of a small town diner. The story that had unfolded was one of mystery, horror, and ultimately hope, a reminder that even in the darkest of nights, there is always a path forward, illuminated by the first light of understanding and the possibility of forgiveness. And so, as Jack moved forward into the light of a new day, the diner behind him stood not as a mere building, but as a monument to the complex, often painful journey towards peace and understanding. It was a closing of sorts, not just of a night filled with hauntings and revelations, but of the lingering echoes of a past that had finally found its rest 